informative and um, you're giving us hope that something is coming closer for us. Um, yeah, we've got some questions from people who have been watching the webinar. Um, so Louise Carter is very keen to know if there's a, you think there is a cure coming or that it's very unlikely. Um, I would say I would say a cure is unlikely, um, simply because you know we always throw this term around that many as is multifactorial. No two many as suffers are the same. I think most of you are probably autoimmune. Some of you are viral induced autoimmune. Some of you are genetic. Some of you have had you know, traumatic uh, damage to the inner ear structure. And so if if someone's had a a disruption, a physical disruption to the end lymphatic sac, and that's resulted in many years disease. You're not going to give that particular sufferer gene therapy to to help them cure their many years disease. Even if you could somehow determine that uh, and and uh, um, uh, subcompartment the various many years sufferers into their different subpopulations, and then say, okay, we've now worked out which group of the many years sufferers have a genetic um, under uh, basis for their disease. Well, now you've got to say, well, I'm going to come up with gene therapy for, for many years disease to somehow get a virus with a gene into the inner ear, have that spread around throughout the inner ear without it doing too much damage. Um, it, gene therapy for the inner ear is coming, for, not for many years disease, but it is coming for hearing loss. It's still at least, I would say, 20 or 30 years away, if I'm being generous, because there's just so much to consider. Um, Gene therapy can work if you've got a very simple genetic disorder, but I don't think many years disease is a simple genetic disorder. It's going to be a disorder that has multiple genes. If it's genetic in, in nature, there'll be multiple genes that, are just, that, that uh, have gone awry. And that, you know, as I said, there will be many causes. So I don't think there's a cure. I think there's a, an effective therapy is coming. Okay. Yes. Uh, Richard asks, um, is there anything for people who are past the vertigo so they don't have vertigo anymore? Um, and sorry, it just <laughs> ran off the screen. Um, yeah, so they don't have vertigo anymore, but they endure severe chronic bilateral balance disorder. Is there anything to help them with that? Um, that's always going to be a hard one. I, you know, you're, we're assuming that someone who's sort of in that burnout stage and no longer having vertigo attacks but they've got balance disorders. Effectively, what we think is their vestibular systems are so dysfunctional now that they're not working. You have basically, you may as well have just destroyed all of the vestibular hair cells. Um, I don't think that, unfortunately, I don't think there's going to be a, an easy way of recovering their hair cell therapy. In, the only thing I could say is that there is often these, you do have these strange situations where you know, many of sufferers who had zero hearing, they hadn't had, hadn't had hearing for five, six years, or they had really bad, no balance in a particular, um, in a particular ear. And then during surgery, uh, so they, where they go to get a cochlear implant in, something happens and they relieve the pressure and all of a sudden they can hear again. And so there is often cases where suddenly function can come back because the end lymphatic pressure that was causing them to have no hearing or no balance is suddenly relieved. So I wouldn't say there's no hope for them to um, get their balance function back. Um, but uh, my gut tells me that they've probably lost a lot of their vestibular hair cells and they're not going to be recovered. It might be that they haven't lost vestibular hair cells and we can maybe have a drug that reduces the high drops and they miraculously get balance function back. But I don't, if I'm being honest, I don't know. And I probably would think there's not a lot of hope once you've lost that level of, of balance function, you're going to get it back. So, so I'm sorry. Yep, that's okay. Um, Scott asks if uh, he says injury wasn't listed as a cause, and that's also what I believe caused my many years. Oh, yep. But I think you answered that just a little bit uh, a while ago. Um, yeah, I think yeah, there is, you, you hear these people who have had basically you know, car accidents or whatever, yeah. and then they, they develop. And I think there's some really nice uh, research done about three or four years ago, some groups in the States where they had some histolog histological examples of many of sufferers that had had a car accident and showed physical trauma to the end lymphatic sac. And that was a pretty clear case for what might be causing their high drops. Yeah. Um, I'm, I've got one from Travis from um, Dizzy's Down, Dizzy's Down Under. He wants to know how we can get rid of the fullness or the pressure feeling in our ear. Um, yeah, that's again, uh, not, um, 
not a simple one to solve. I, I don't have any magic tricks. I mean, I think, you, you know, probably the best people to answer that would be other many years sufferers. I mean, how do mm. they do it? Um, there is no drug that we know that can do it. Um, uh, you know, I, I'd have all sorts of theories, but I have no idea if they'd work um, in terms of getting rid of the fullness in the ear. Uh, I think sometimes we tend to think that the feeling of fullness in the inner ear may not actually be because the ear has got significant pressure. It might be that <laughs> if you lose a lot of your, your low frequency hearing, uh, without any hydrostatic pressure, do you naturally have this sensation that your ear is full just because you're not hearing any low frequencies? And so maybe amplifying low frequencies um, could maybe help with that. Um, I don't know. Uh, but it, you know, I, I'm always interested to see what happens with these, you know, the increased involvement of uh, hearing aids and there's this progression of hearing aids. Now, many of you would be aware that you know, they've got the implantable hearing aids or the, the, the um, the medical hearing aids and now you've got these sort of other ear pod type devices that are evolving to change the way we hear uh do people that have those on for a longer period of time that have we've amplified low frequency sounds do they start to sort of feel like there's less fullness in the inner ear that's but that's all me just hand waving i've got no evidence yeah. to suggest yeah that. I've um, got a cochlear implant and I think that my ear fullness and pressure is much less now that I've got the cochlear implant. I can definitely tell when I don't have it on, it, my ear feels more pressure and more full. Yeah. When you don't so have it on your feet. Yeah, when I yeah. don't have it on, I can tell. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. There's another question here from Kim who says, if you don't know your cause for many ears and you have it unilaterally, so one ear, what should we be doing to protect our other good ear? <laughs> um, crossing your fingers? No, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I, until we've got a drug that can prevent it, um, that I don't think, I mean, you, you could maybe say, you know, work with your doctor to say, if, if, if a treatment is working, if you find that there is a particular treatment or if you're going to give systemic drugs in the ear that's bad and you're finding that relief, from corticosteroids you know, that it helps temporarily you might work with them and say well what are the chances you actually also give it my good ear just to provide? maybe they'd, they'd probably say they won't do it um mm. but i mean that that would be my only advice to sort of say there's not you know if something if a drug does work don't be averse to maybe seeing if you can put it in the other ear as well to make sure that it doesn't go bilateral but i, I it might be the one of those things you should maybe not be too fearful over i, I don't know yeah and i've got a question from me Mm -hmm. Why um, did you decide to study many years disease? Um, it's an interesting one. So when I was going through university, I knew I wanted to go into neuroscience. Um, probably second year of university, I remember I had uh, a very passionate lecturer um, who we sort of had an engineering background, and he sort of taught us about the the the, the inner ear and the cochlea and and. It, it's naturally the, the inner ear because it's so complex and there's a lot of mechanics and physics involved. It's not, and I've sort of had that bit of a pinch on for those, that, that type of research anyway. So it's sort of drawn to understanding the inner ear. And I remember this sort of, I think I just learned about um, aquaporins and, and, um, and, uh, um, uh, um, and anti-fluid drugs and anti diuretic drugs. Um, and, I was sort of saying, well, why don't we just give many air sufferers antidiuretic drugs? I mean, isn't that antidiuretic drug doesn't increase the levels of aquaporins on tissues? And couldn't that maybe help with relieving the, the fluid increase in, 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 in lymphatic high drops? And I sort of went down this, just, just as a young student does, you think, oh, I'm onto something here. And maybe I, for all of a sudden I felt smart. And I was the first time at university, I felt smart. And uh, sort of went down a rabbit hole of studying um, the effects of antidiuretic drugs on the inner ear and kind of came up with a bunch of things and took it to the, the lecturer at the time. And he said, well, it's really impressive that you've gone now because that's exactly what people are now looking at for treating many ears and yeah, right. smart, but con subsequently realized that it wasn't a thing. <laughs> uh, but, but by the way of that, I had a, developed a bit of a, um, a, a relationship with that lecturer who ended up being my PhD supervisor. So that's kind of how I got into inner ear research. Cool. One more question, um, Julianne. We're one more? Time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Louise is asking, should we be eating um, berries for <laughs> antioxidants? Well, that's, it's interesting. There's a lot of groups that have actually looked at, um, uh, there was, there's a lot of research, particular, probably about 
10 years ago, maybe still ongoing, um, what antioxidant drugs or sorry, antioxidant diets should people with um, in ear disorders be be taking and eating? And there was, you know, high doses of of um, of um, Red Bull. I mean, Red Bull's got a you know, taurine, really powerful antioxidant in it. And with basically, there's various groups saying, "Oh, have this food, have that drink," because antioxidants are great for the inner ear. And they were trying to work out whether or not, um, you know, high levels of antioxidants in your diet can be beneficial to our hearing. I don't know where that went to. Uh, that research, I don't know what the net outcome of it, whether or not you can get enough antioxidants in your diet to have a significant, clinically significant um, effect on your hearing. But it's worth a try, definitely. Okay. I don't don't put blueberries in your ear though I would say <laughs> <laughs> there yes. was a question I'd put in there you okay. asked um and it was when you talked about the drugs that have been shown to assist with um increasing hearing and the reduction in tinnitus um because tinnitus was one of the things that a lot of us have in common yeah. um it was a theme when we got together at Christmas time I just thought that that was very interesting I know it was very early on in your talk but yeah yeah like uh, tinnitus is a difficult one um i i've always shied away from tinnitus because it is very complex in its nature um going back to this idea actually most of the people that were doing the antioxidant research in the diet were actually focused on tinnitus because of, you know and they were in the, a lot of it was done in the uk the tinnitus association the uk group were quite uh prevalent i think they had a lot of funding and were funding a significant trial of of antioxidants in the diet for treating um, tinnitus and so hopefully hopefully these antioxidant drugs are also very effective for for tinnitus i know that the epsilon one of the the outcomes of that was a significant improvement in, in hearing but it was also a significant reduction in the in tinnitus yeah. so uh, yeah it, it, it's it's likely that it, again it won't it probably won't cure the tinnitus but hopefully if it's yeah, particularly if you get it, if you'd start treatment earlier early enough um, then it might prevent the progression of tinnitus and can any of these drugs actually help you regrow the ears because that's one of the things we get damaged mm -hmm. to the ears and our ears and just you were talking about that earlier with the yeah. cancer patches and the treatment i thought that was mm -hmm. interesting no that, that these that's the point is these drugs they're not a cure they're not going to regrow we, i'm working actively we've got some um we, we do have i'm working with a group that got funded large amount of funding uh middle of last year to actively work on gene therapy to regrow hair cells in the inner ear. Um, and so when I say, you know, gene therapy to regrow hair cells is 10 to 30 years away, I, you know, I say that quietly because in the grant, we're sort of saying this could be five years away, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's a lot of problems with it. Um, but uh, but the, the, the therapies, the drug therapies that we're, I've been sort of talking and focusing on aren't, they're not gonna help regrow hair cells. Um, they are really just to prevent ongoing damage in the ear um, as sort of a, to provide you to prevent the degrees progression um, and and I and you know there's lots of people suffer lots of or have lots of underlying disorders but they just treat and keep at bay very happily with the sort of daily you know oils and treatments and it's enough you know, and for many years community if you have been a very effective treatment that you don't have to worry too much about doesn't cost too much and you can just have it go on for 30 years then I think for, I, if I was a mini sufferer, I'd say that's enough. It's not going to cost me an arm and a leg. It's effective. That's all I'm asking. 